Great. Well, hello. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome everyone to the fifth webinar in our series of food strategy for your city. It's a real pleasure to see you all joining us today from around the world as usual. Today, we're going to start delving into how to craft your strategy to really make it very site specific to your city and your citizenship. So we're going to be looking at how to use data, how to map and how to really get to know your city. We've got fantastic speakers as ever today. Um, and although data doesn't always sound like the most exciting uh, element of creating a strategy, I think we're gonna have a really, really interesting session today um, with the, the four speakers that we've got lined up for you. Housekeeping, as ever, we are recording, so please keep your cameras off if you would not like to be um, on film. Um, please keep yourselves on mute. Use the chat function. We'd love to hear from you, where you're from, um, what you do in your respective cities. And of course, if you have any questions at all, please drop, drop them in to the chat box and we'll be holding a bit of space for a Q&A towards the end of the session. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce the first of our speakers today. And first up, we have Joy Carey from the Ruaf Global Partnership on Sustainable Urban Agriculture and Food Systems. Joy is an independent sustainable food systems consultant who focuses on cities, and she's based here in my city of Bristol, where I've had the pleasure of working with her on and off over the years. And she's worked in a sustainable food and farming with UK and international organic and local food sectors since 1990. She's a founding director of Bristol Food Network, coordinator of Bristol's Food Partnership, and her work has been really key in informing RUAF's work with FAO on city region food systems, and has inspired many other cities around the world to assess their own food systems. Most recently, she's been working on the new MUFPP Monitoring Framework Practical Handbook and Resource Pack for Cities, which is a fantastic resource, uh, which she is going to be telling us about today. Thanks so much. Over to you, Joy. Thanks, Florence. Just sharing my screen. Is this visible to everybody? Good. Yes, looks great. Thanks, Joy. So, um, hello, everybody. It, uh, firstly, thanks very much to the Food Foundation for organising these webinars, and I'm delighted to be part of today's discussions. Also to say from the outset, I was privileged to work with two of the speakers today in a, a project in 2019, which I will be talking about. So I'm going to start off by looking at um, assessment and monitoring generally, and I'd like to introduce the new Milan Pact um, handbook and resource pack. It's a freely available practical tool that I hope you'll all be able to use as you develop your food strategies. First question then, so why work with data? Um, beginning with some reflections on why they're so important um, to creating and evolving effective food strategies. So why, why bother with data? Why don't we just focus on action? Well, I've got four reasons. Firstly, to make visible what's actually happening. Secondly, to help us see the big picture and connect up different elements. Thirdly, to enable us to monitor progress, measure impacts and changes. And fourthly, and this is most important, to be able to target and be impactful in our actions. So in order to ensure that our food strategies are relevant, meaningful and impactful for our cities, we need to find ways to assess the current context think and plan priorities for joint collaborative work with other stakeholders. A city food monitoring framework has to be proactively created in the same way as a strategy. Most cities don't have food system monitoring processes in place and no single department or officer or organization can do this task on their own. If the ultimate purpose of a food strategy is to create change, then of course we first need to know, we need to th consider three really important questions. So what big change or changes are we trying to make? What's our direction of travel? Secondly, how will we know if we've been successful in making those changes? What information 
do we need as evidence of that change? And thirdly, how will we continue to track our progress towards these desired changes from a, a really clear starting point? In most instances, we'll need to first find out more information about what's really going on before we can properly answer these three important questions. And that would be then in the form of more research or mapping, assessments, audits. And then we need to find ways of assessing or measuring change. So using relevant or agreed indicators, things that will tell us that we're actually making the change that we want to make happen. And these will enable us to track progress over time. They should also help us to see if we're not making any progress. Third slide, doesn't want to move. Not quite sure why that's not moving, there we go. Um, sorry about that, everybody. So I'm hoping that everybody will be familiar with the Milan Pact Monitoring Framework, which is a tool designed by cities for cities. And it is for working on food system transformation, but it's combining at the same time developing a strategy and also developing a monitoring framework. So setting out a really clear progress plan, clear starting points and deciding what indicators to use that will help to track progress. So going on to assessments, my own work over the last decade has focused on developing practical approaches on food system assessment and planning. In simple terms, there are two broad approaches to food system assessment. Can look at the whole system or look at very specific issues and in each case you would assess situations in relation to the specific criteria. So on the screen now is a, a diagram of the city region food system. This is part of an online assessment toolkit also produced by RUAF and FAO and it just shows the complexity and the different things that we might be wanting to assess against. So looking at the whole food system it might be just a city focus or it might be including the surrounding region. An assessment might be in relation to, for example, food security and food supply, or it might be in relation to resilience to climate change aspects, just as a, a simple example. I'm going to have trouble moving my screen again for some reason. There we go. OK. This diagram is a, a visual summary of the assessment approach I took when doing a baseline audit in Bristol. And the purpose was to understand strengths and vulnerabilities in the food system in relation to planning for future resilience. It involved looking at the whole food system as this diagram shows from production, processing, distribution, retail, catering and waste, but also looking at other angles so taking many different types of data from many different sources. So I looked at food business data and um, spreadsheets became very exciting to me. Um, just this incredible source of information on who was doing what in the city on food. But understanding how land has been used, how much land is available, what types of staple foods are produced across the city region, how much of that locally produced food is actually coming into the city, what the provision infrastructure it actually looks like, to what extent communities are involved, etc. So it's a very broad assessment and it basically gave us a lot of baseline data and an overview of what was going on in 2011. This is a, a, just an example of how some of this data has been used. So in this case, this is to do with food provision. Um, it's an online map with layers of data, um, which just show where you can find a variety of food related services. This is in my own city in Bristol. Moving on um, to a different type of approach. If you're, I've just spoken about whole system, but if you were then going to look at a much more focused assessment, it might be to consider and investigate specific elements or issues. So this slide is from the city of Quito, sets out three of the Milan Pact work streams in the left hand side, governance, sustainable diets, and nutrition, and food waste, and then their selected indicators, things they wanted to measure against to see how they were doing and to set baseline data from. So if we focus on the food waste element of that, they looked at 
who was doing what, what types of activities were happening, and then how much food was being rescued. Um, and so that was in relation to these, these indicators at the bottom. They also looked at, with stakeholders, trying to understand in a bit more detail why this situation was the case. And one of the things that Keto highlighted was that Research highlighted the lack of any government policy on sustainable diets and nutrition. So that was kind of going back to what the national context is. And it wasn't until they did their local assessment that they could really see that so clearly. Um, and they also concluded that data gaps, so where there isn't any information, can be sometimes more useful than the data for itself, because it tells you where you really need to focus. So we might also want to do an overall assessment of what the food system related activities are that are already happening in the city. And again, the Milan Pact framework really helps to do this. It provides a, a template almost, a ready-made template from which you can develop your own strategy and your own monitoring program and tracking progress. Of course, these indicators, which you can see oh. on the right hand side, oh. always need to be adapted oh, and customised to suit the, the local context. So this year, um, we have produced a new handbook, which has been, um, is available online based on the pilot project that we ran to implement the monitoring framework in 2019 with Nairobi, Antananarivo and Quito. I would really strongly encourage all of you to have a look at it. Um, and this diagram is, is very much the foundation of, of that handbook. It's a step-by-step -step guide to how you work through this process and how you bring together both planning your strategy, but at the same time, establishing your monitoring framework. It's available here. I think this should be, these details should be available after this session, but it's got uh, this step-by-step -step guide plus a resource pack of worksheets, practical ideas, things that you can use in workshops, discussions with stakeholders, etc. It's all practical and it's all based on very real experience that we, things we actually did in, in 2019. So my take home messages here are, please do make use of the Milan Pack resources. They are designed by cities for cities, so I really hope you'll find them useful. Um, focus just on a few priorities when it comes to working with data, but definitely make data part of this planning process because it can really shine a light on, on things that sometimes aren't so obvious. And then always consider in advance how your communicator make use of the data you collect, because data on its own is a lot of effort for not much gain. Thanks everyone for listening. Um, Fantastic. Thank you, Joy. That was a really, really uh, great introduction. Um, and we've certainly tried to really base everything we're doing through this webinar series in, in practicalities um, uh, and, and, you know, information and resources that, that really actually translate into action. So I think that's a really great example of that. Um, next up, we have our first practitioner speaker who is joining us from the city of Antananarivo. We have Tokiana Rakatonareni. Um, and uh, Tokiana holds the title of Decentralized Cooperation Officer. He has a Master of Arts in Public Administration from the University of Madras in India and a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science from Liscombe University in Nashville, Tennessee in the USA. He spent over five years working at the municipality of Antananarivo as International Relation Officer officer, sorry, and he started as the Milan Pact Focal Point in 2019. And Tokiana implemented the pilot project on the Milan Urban Food Policy Pact monitoring framework with the support of colleagues at RUAF and FAO. So over to you, Tokiana. Thank you very much. Thank you, Florence, for the introduction. And uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I would like to, can you, Florence, start the screen sharing, please? Absolutely. Let me just bring that up for us now. Mine is also going quite slowly as Joyce was. Here we are. Hopefully everyone can see that now. Yes. Uh, first screen, please.
So first of all, I'm going to start for a, a brief introduction of the uh, city of uh, Tananarivo, and then I will go through the process of uh, using of a monitoring framework. So basically, Antananarivo is uh, the capital city of uh, Madagascar in the Indian Ocean, and uh, it, uh, it can be divided in uh, six uh, boroughs, and uh, we have a 192 subdivision of uh, Uktan, which is a uh, Cartier. And the population for the city is around 1 million and uh, 274, uh, approximately the population within the city. But for the metropolitan area, it's around uh, 3 million 623 uh, population. Uh, the city is uh, generally uh, formed by 45% uh, of uh, cultivable areas and 20% of the population can be considered as a farmers. Next slide, please. So basically, uh, as I said, 45% uh, of the capital surface is cultivated and uh, Rural activities uh, dominate most of the Malagasy territory. These activities are uh, considered part of uh, food systems and uh, agriculture is visible everywhere in the city and the outskirts of the city because uh, as I said, 45% of the surface area is uh, agricultural and cultivated more than one third of a municipality is uh, agricultural, uh, like uh, irrigated crops in the metropolitan area also. The plains which cover the capital and its peripheries favor the activities on food systems, like 75% uh, of household activities revolve around the urban agricultural food system and uh, transport and uh, food uh, vendors and uh, food trucks. The, the majority of uh, vegetables consumed in the capital are produced locally, like 90 to 100% of uh, crescent are, for example, produced locally, 90% of the eggs and 20% of uh, the rice consumed in the capital city are produced locally. Uh, Basically, we are facing a rapid uh, urbanization growth in the city, and uh, most of the uh, production of foods are provided by the outskirts uh, city, like peripheries. So, income source activities are also undertaken by uh, NGOs and the uh, partners of uh, capital city. So, next slide, please. I'm now going to start with uh, the process of using of a monitoring framework. Uh, in the beginning, uh, the city uh, considered that this project was very important because uh, it is another, another way of uh, collecting data for the work and activities of the city because previous this uh, project, the city did not really have any official uh, data collection process with uh, like for the city, but each department have their own uh, tools for the collection of uh, data. So this tool is like uh, very important for the city because uh, it enabled us to have more insight of uh, situation in the field. So basically for the indicator selection, before the signing of a Milan Pact, the municipality have been working with uh, urban agriculture project, and uh, we did not really have some uh, monitoring of this project, but it was just done as uh, to reduce the vulnerability of uh, population. Then there is a boost of a food system project through the use of a monitoring from a project. Like uh, it enabled us to focus more on the food system policies. Internal team was uh, organized to do the planning and the coordination of the data collection and the data analysis. 
Uh, also, the project enabled the municipality to work together with diverse uh, stakeholders like the civil society, NGOs, and uh, the national institutions like academia and uh, universities and other uh, central government institutions. The main point of uh, drafting of uh, a city by law on the food policy committee was oh, the main, one that was one of the main objectives of uh, using of a monitoring framework. Uh, next slide, please. Yes, and the selection process, we took three steps to, to do the selection process of the indicators. The first one is the evaluation criteria, which is the power of uh, each indicator selected to collect result about what is actually happening in the city. And are also as an enabler to think how such existing actions and strategies could uh, be improved. The second one is the sustainability criteria which is the accountability in the long term and the increase and uh, to preserve all of the data available in the capital city. And the last one is the resource criteria. As I said in the beginning, the municipality did not really have any uh, specific tools for data collection. So this uh, monitoring framework was uh, very relevant for us in the covering of uh, baseline data, and also for uh, to leverage capacity to boost partnership and uh, fundraising for uh, future actions. Next slide, please. So in the next slide, uh, I am going to show the, how we did the, uh, uh, like prioritizing the, the indicators, like which indicators are more uh, useful for the city based on the advantage that these uh, MUFPP indicators will bring to us. Like first, for the first one, the ensuring an enabling environment for effective actions in the governance. We choose the indicators because the, of the indicators boost of uh, organization of the governance for the municipality. The second one brought us the increase of, uh, like for example, number of uh, city-led actions and a strategy to promote sustainable uh, diets. The next one is the social and economic uh, equity. These indicators brought us the insight of the outcome of uh, our actions within the food system activity and strategy. The next one is the food production. For example, uh, this uh, brought us the approximate uh, data for the cultivable area within the city of Antanana River. The next one is the food supply and uh, distribution. Uh, for that one, we chose the number of fresh foods and vegetables uh, that uh, uh, were produced within the limits of uh, the city of Antananarivo. And the last one is the food waste uh, indicators, which uh, enable us to have uh, more uh, accurate uh, data for the total annual uh, volume of food waste within the capital city. Next slide, please. So basically to finish, to wrap up my uh, presentation, the benefits for the uh, city of Antananarivo of using this uh, monitoring framework was it allowed us to choose the main priorities based on the indicators, which are more uh, relevant for uh, like, for example, which actions bring more uh, results for the city in terms of uh, time limit, like uh, short term or long term uh, commitment and engagement of the city in relating to food systems. <laughs> then we have the cross sectoral engagement. Uh, this uh, monitoring framework enabled us also to have more uh, 
like connection with uh, our uh, stakeholders. Like uh, 40 stakeholders were able to make to the workshop during the session. And they are now part of uh, stakeholders engagement of the city in all of our uh, actions and strategy. Next one is the, it created more cohesion and strengthened the coordination between uh, multiple departments of uh, the municipality. Then it also promoted the participative analysis and creation of a common vision for uh, Antananarivo. And the last one, it created more uh, friendship with other cities who are implementing the, the framework. So I'm, I'm also uh, inviting each uh, city that are following this session to, to check out the Milan Pact because uh, this uh, platform is really helpful for city to implement the, the food system strategy in the city. So thank you very much. And the last uh, slide is just the reports that uh, the city Antananarive drafted for, for, this, uh, for the use of a monitoring framework uh, presented by FAO and uh, RUAF. Thank you, everyone. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Tokiana. Um, and yes, we've mentioned the Milan Urban Food Policy Pact a number of times through the series, um, and we will be hearing from them in our next webinar in two weeks' time, where they'll be telling us more about the pact um, and about their work as well. So uh, we were due to welcome Dr. Daniel uh, Karugub um, to join us, but unfortunately he's unwell. So um, his colleague um, has stepped up in his place. So it's my delight to introduce Winifred Katumo. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm uh, Winfred Katumo uh, from Nairobi, Kenya. Uh, my partner, Dr. Karugu, was supposed to present, but uh, as you have told, been told is unwell. I'm an holder of a Bachelor of Science in Horticulture. I've also done MSc irrigation from uh, Florence University in Italy. Uh, from 1999, I joined the Minister of Agriculture and I've been able to add about uh, four districts as the head of agriculture. I've also worked with the Milan Hub and Food Policy Pact Indicators together with Joy and Tokiano. Uh, we, 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 we spearheaded it in uh, 2019 where we were able to monitor the indicators. And we reported in the, in the forum, which was held in France in 2019. And uh, I'm happy to be a participant and also a speaker for today. From Nairobi, we want to share about urban early warning, early action. And uh, this is a tool for food urban, uh, for food, urban security surveillance. And uh, why this tool? Just a minute. Why this tool? Uh, from Sorry 2009. To Sorry to you can hear me? We can hear you perfectly clear. Yes, but it would be great if you could um, go into presenter mode so we can see your slides full screen. You can see now? You can see? We, yes, that's great. Thank you very much. It's okay. Yes, that's perfect. Thank you. Okay. Maybe before I go to the tool, I can talk about Nairobi. Nairobi is the capital city of Kenya. This is one of the 47 counties in Kenya. Nairobi is a major econom economic hub in the East Africa region. It's also a, a home for the UNEP and UN habitat. And the population of Nairobi is about 4.3 million. 60% of the population, they reside in low income informal settlements and 22% uh, they, they, they are below the poverty line. And I've talked about, we are, we are presenting a tool, a tool by the name Urban Hali Warning, Hali Action. This is a tool of urban food security surveillance. Uh, why the tool? In two, from uh, the year 2009, existing food uh, security surveillance tools were not sensitive to the urban food situation. 
It's only the rural areas which had a tool whereby they were using the weather, the crop acreage, and uh, yet the urban food uh, security can only be determined by the incomes. The incomes uh, drives the food security issues in an urban setup. The global acute malnutrition threat thresholds, when applied in an urban setting, uh, they were leaving the huge populations unattended. So a new tool was needed so that it can be sensitive and also specific to the urban settings. Uh, for the surveillance, the indicators and the thresholds, uh, this one now for the urban setting, five indicators were, were identified. And uh, one of them is the equivalized monthly income, then the percentage or the proportion of the household with the one or, 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 or more stable income earner, or the number of food baskets per month, or maybe the, pro and the proportion of the households with children with diarrhea in the last one month, proportion also of the households experiencing shock in the last one month. These are the indicators which were, were, de were determined so that they can give a real situation of a food security in an urban setup. So uh, we have no more alert, alarm, and emergency. And uh, each one of them, the tool, is able to indicate whether the situation of the food in a city, whether it's in a normal. And that one, for example, if we are looking at the indicator of the income, this is if equivalent monthly income is more than 8,000 Kenya shillings. This, this is like 8 US dollars. Uh, for the alert is between uh, uh, $65 to $80. For the alarm is about $50 US dollars to $65 US dollars. And for the emergency, it's known when a household has about less than 50 US dollars. And again, these are the other indicators. And uh, uh, listing is meant using sensors. Now, when we go to the field, when we are carrying out now the survey to identify the, the food security in, in the urban setup, the listing is meant using the sensors on all households in a target area uh, classified. Like now for Nairobi, we chose three informal settlements. That is K Kibera. I know it's known by most of the people. We have also Mukuru. We have also Gorokosho. These are three informal settlements. And in those, in, such, uh, in those settlements, we have villages. So we also uh, do the boundaries. We, we use the boundaries on the map of the settlements. And also we segment the areas. Settlements are stratified based on the area and the households to be sampled are identified randomly in a segment. As you can see in the map, that's how we do the segmenting. Once we go to an area, the map shown here, it's, a, 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 it's a Korokosho. As I told you, Korokosho is one of the informal settlements in Nairobi and it's a big one. Uh, for the sampling frame method, uh, we have the settlement, the number of households, the number of households sampled. Like now, for example, the Mukuru informal settlements, the number of households are there, they are, they are about 121,570, and we sampled 360. For Korogosha informal settlements, 11,149, and we sampled 345. For Kibera, Again, an informal settlement, uh, there are 70,617 households and we sampled 350. So in total, we, we were looking at 203,334 households and we only sampled 1,055 of them. In addition, in every settlement, we took one market per settlement so that for the purposes of uh, the food prices, we wanted to determine the food prices in that area, which will also determine the cost of food per basket. When we are talking about food basket, 
we are looking at the essential foods like uh, the cereals. We are also looking at the proteins. We are also looking at the fat, the cooking oil, the essential things, and even sugar, milk. We are looking at those things. Uh, data collection preparation. How we do it is uh, we have a pool of 30 enumerators and three supervisors that are drawn from agriculture, health and marketing. Data collection is done for seven days every two months. That is my monthly. Each data collection mission comprises of nine enumerators for household data. Uh, I said again, three markets. We sample three markets. We have uh, three supervisors and one leader. Pre-survey, data collection per se, we, are, we, we, we do a pre-survey refresher training uh, for one day, whereby we bring all the enumerators and uh, the supervisors together. And uh, each enumerator is allocated a list of households interviewed by surveillance leader and facilitated to visit the sites. Then we carry out face-to-face -face interviews using a preset questionnaire in the COBO uh, collection in the COBO collection, uh, this is a tool. Then answers are captured on enabled uh, cell phone. Yeah, with the work with the cell phones. And uh, data is transmitted electro electronically to the central dashboard. There's a dashboard, a central dashboard where data is transmitted. And then analysis of data is done by the dashboard and results are displayed. For some of the results in 2020, this was in August 2020, and uh, uh, the indicators there, again, I said we, are, we worked or we, we, all, all we usually work on the three informal settlements, that is Mukuru, Korosho, and Kibira. We are going to expand to others soon, but these are the ones which we have been working on. We look at the shocks, equivalent income, food basket, the stable, income Anna and the child diarrhea. And as you can see, for example, Mukuru, all these indicators, they were showing red. And therefore uh, here, uh, some, some, some uh, support was needed. Unlike in Gorogosho, whereby it's only about two areas which are showing emergency and Kibira. So out of the three of them, uh, Mukuru was hardly it. Sorry uh, to interrupt, Winfred. Just yes. about a minute, a minute to wrap up, if you if you could, please. Yeah, the, we have a feedback strategy whereby we do a report. We send it to the Nairobi Disaster Management and the other agencies, and then response is taken. Uh, as I told you, we have the normal alert, alarm, and emergency to know what is happening, and. Uh, I've talked about all this, and we are saying this is a tool which won the Milan Urban Food Policy 2019 Special Mention Award for Social and Economic Equity. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, and congratulations on your award. It's a fantastic achievement. Um, some really, uh, again, really interesting um, and useful practical information Thank there. You. Thank so, you. Uh, bringing us on to our very last speaker today, we are handing over to Dr. Nikhil. Surinavasapura Venkatesha Murthy. He's a medical doctor with an MD in community medicine from the All India Institute of Medical Sciences in New Delhi. And he currently works as project manager at the Public Health Foundation of India based in Visakhapatnam in Andhra Pradesh. He oversees the on-ground implementation of the Sustainable and Healthy Food Systems Project Chefs, one of our partners uh, on the Food Cities 2022 project. And he leads the implementation of large scale community based surveys to assess prevalence of non -communicable, communicable diseases and their risk factors, which we're looking forward to hearing about. Thank you very much. Over to you, Nikhil. Thanks, uh, Florence. I'll share my slides. Are you able to see? Yes, super, thank you. Yeah. So uh, thank you, Florence, for that introduction and for the invitation to speak uh, in the webinar. Uh, so good morning, good afternoon, 
good evening you know, based on wherever you are and you are joining us from so um, i'm nikhil i'm a medical doctor uh, working as project manager at phfi i'm also a bernard law scholar at the uh, harvard th chan school of public health uh, i'm based in visakhapatnam it's one of the beautiful cities on the east coast of india in the southern part of india and uh, one of the cities which is actually participating in the smart cities challenge so in the next 8 uh, minutes or so uh, i'll be talk talking about why is there need for data um, how to collect them or rather how did we collect the data in our research projects some key findings from our projects and uh, what can cities do to uh, collect the data or the information that is required to develop city level strategies so uh, you may ask you know why why is data required so the research evidence has shown that especially in public health uh, the strategies which are based on data and that are contextual have a high rate of success when compared to those strategies which are not you know uh, based on the data so before implementing any strategy a baseline assessment is uh, necessary to understand uh, you know where you stand and uh, measure what has changed and uh, you know how much of that change has occurred because of effective implementation of the strategy uh the data the data also helps you in understanding uh, the trends uh, for example if uh, you know whatever change that you saw uh, was the change sustained over time or did it you know sort of rise initially plateau and then you know uh, dropped off uh, very quickly uh data from successful strategies will actually help uh, showcase some success stories and also will help uh, scaling up strategies into new places and contexts with appropriate modifications as necessary uh sometimes strategies uh, actually don't work so data will also help you to understand why these strategies did not work in your setting so broadly there are uh, two types of data one is primary data wherein you collect the information that you require for developing your strategy whereas the other type of data is uh, secondary data wherein the data has already been collected by someone else uh, for some other reason but you use it to develop your strategy so i'll be talking about our experience in visakhapatnam in um, collecting primary data under two different projects one is called uday the other is shafs um, uday is a diabetes and hypertension prevention and management program which we are implementing since 2013 it's actually been implemented in two districts one in sonipat in northern india and visakhapatnam in southern india so we work both in rural as well as urban areas in these districts uh, in a population of approximately uh, 4 lakh or you know or 400000 population the second project is chefs uh, that is sustainable and healthy food system like floren said uh, chefs is one of the project one of the partners for these uh, webinar series so this project aims to uh, provide evidence to policy makers on how to design uh, sustainable and healthy food systems for uh, future generations of india so um, this is the uh, 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 methodology that we followed uh, to collect the data we had to first choose the participants and uh, we actually followed a systematic methodology first uh, so i'm talking about the methodology that we followed in urban visakhapatnam the city of visakhapatnam so first we uh, selected the census enumeration blocks uh, in the wards that we were working in so these census enumeration blocks are like uh, sub units within a larger ward and uh, they are actually uh, recognized by the census authority of india so once we were done selecting census enumeration blocks we then uh, randomly selected households within those census enumeration blocks um households are defined as you know a group of people living in a common structure eating from the same kitchen so that is again the definition used by census bureau of india so then we selected households and in the last step we selected the uh, participants from the uh, households so th there was one male participant and one female participant aged 30 years and above from each household that we selected so we administered a questionnaire uh, through trained data collectors and collected information on social demographic characteristics their education occupation family history of uh, chronic conditions physical activity and diet we measured their blood glucose hba1c blood pressure height and weight so all this information was collected electronically so that uh, the data capture uh, happened in real time and we had access to the data real time so that if there were any errors we could you know rectify it then and there so um, uh, we surveyed around the 3000 participants in the city of visakhapatnam 
nearly um, 53 percent of them were uh, females and um, as you can see there's a high burden of uh, chronic conditions in Vishakapatnam city and um, only 38 percent of people were uh, were you know eating recommended uh, servings of uh, fruits and vegetables and uh, the dietary diversity was uh, very low in this uh, population so apart from collecting the information from individuals we also map the built environment in a study area. So what you see here is an image of a part of uh, the Vishakhapatnam city with the Bay of Bengal to the east. So the dots, I'm not sure whether you're able to see clearly, are the uh, points uh, you know, that we map using uh, geocoding. These were uh, either shops selling fruits and vegetables, um, farmers market, or as we call here in Vishakhapatnam, Raitu bazaars, uh, grocery stores, uh, supermarkets, small uh, Kirana shops, or uh, shops selling dairy and dairy products, etc. So this gave us an idea of the geographical spread of these places, uh, where you know people would go to buy their food and food products, and um, you know how much distance uh, was uh, between these places and their households, and we looked at whether the distance affected uh, their you know, ability to uh, the quantity that they purchased. Uh, so uh, I've spoken about mostly quantitative data now, but um, uh, we also collected uh, qualitative data. So these data are not necessarily numbers, but people's perceptions and opinions. So the, the data that I explained in the previous slides were collected from the participants, but uh, whereas we also collected data uh, by the party, we also use data by the participants. So this was uh, uh, this is a uh, this is a method called as participatory action research photo voice method. Um, I will not go into the details of the method because of the you know paucity of time. But uh, uh, this is a method wherein communities use pictures that they click uh, in their communities to you know highlight issues that they are reported to them. Like for example, all these pictures that I'm projecting are pictures that were clicked by the community members. So. Um, you know, through these pictures, when we discuss them, they expressed, you know, their views. Like, for example, uh, you know, some people said that uh, it was very easy to access unhealthy foods. You know, these noodles were available in, you know, in a small Kirana shops. Um, they were, uh, you know, uh, worried about excessive use of plastics in packaging of food and food products in supermarkets. Then they were worried about how animals were reared for their meat and poultry products. And, uh, you know, the plastic uh, that is used in milk product, milk packets. You know, they were uh, worried about you know, dis disposing these plastic products, plastic, you know, packets in the environment into the open and, you know, its effect on the environment. So like this, you know, we collected both the qualitative as well as quantitative data in our research projects. Uh, so coming to, uh, you know, the data as well as Eat Right India. So how can you sort of, you know, use the data to uh, 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 address or develop your strategy for Eat Right cities? Like, for example, um, you know, um, the Eat Right uh, campaign has Eat Healthy as one of its uh, component and under Eat Healthy, there is a component to you know, diversify uh, the diet of the population. So if this is the strategy that you want to pursue, like uh, having data on what the people eat, how frequently do they eat, where do they buy their food from, and how much do they pay for it, you know, actually helps in understanding the context of the intervention that you want to do. You can conduct surveys to get this information from a representative sample in your population of your cities. Um, you can also look at the secondary data. For example, uh, in city of Vishakhapatnam, we have data on the amount of fruits and vegetables that come into the city, which is maintained by Department of Marketing and Agriculture. Uh, so you can look at you know how much quantity of fruits and vegetables are coming. Where is it coming from? Is it coming from a nearby village or a district or a, you know, perhaps a state? Because you know shops like you know COVID uh, pandemic can really disrupt these you know supply chains. You can also map places where these you know fruits and vegetables are being sold. So you can see whether they are concentrated in one particular area or they geographically spread out. If you were to set up a new you know right to bazaars or new farm farmer market, you can see where you can you know set it up so that you know access is easy to people. So this is just you know one example of how you can use data to answer a specific question or develop a strategy around the concept. But this sort of thinking can you know help you in uh, uh, developing strategies for improving food nutrition uh, or address any of the uh, pillars of Eat Right campaign like Eat Healthy, Eat Safe, or Eat Sustainable. So I thank you for you know listening to uh, my presentation. And I'm happy to answer any questions either now or you can always contact me if you have any questions 
regarding these developing strategies or how to use data to develop strategies. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Nikhil. Um, I think it was really great as well that you um, highlighted the, the, the quantitative versus qualitative data element. Um, of course, how people feel and um, feel about food and perceive their food environments is, is hugely important and it's not something you can put a number on. So it's really important to, to look at both, um, both those types of data. Fantastic. So we have heard from all of our speakers and now is an opportunity for any questions, um, whether there is anyone in the audience that would like to put their hand up or put a question in the chat box, I'd uh, very much welcome you to do so. And in the absence of that, I will um, put a question to our speakers um, and please do, uh, we do have time for a couple. So if you do think of anything you'd like to ask, please jump in. Um, Joy, you touched upon the fact that there's often gaps in data um, and things that are missing, which can be really helpful uh, to, to see where those gaps are. Is there any data that cities um, often struggle to access um, and how do they plug gaps in, in that data? And that's a question to, to any of our speakers who would like to, uh, like to come in on, on that. Joy, you could start us off if you'd be happy to. Thanks. Yeah, um, it's a big question, Florence. So I think there's lots of data that cities will struggle to access. So maybe I could come at it from the other way and say there is also a lot of data in cities, but it sits with many different organisations. So I mentioned in my presentation the importance of a process and making sure that data work is, is integrated with sort of strategic planning. So if you were working with a stakeholder group, it's very important to find out from those stakeholders what data they have. Um, but before you even do that, it's back to, well, what, what are we trying to change? What's the purpose? And what are we trying to shine a light on? And what do we really need to find out? And if you have that conversation with stakeholders and then discover that there are gaps, that in itself is very important. Why are there gaps? Why is no one looking at that? Actually, is it that the data that is available is not really quite focused on that? Or is no one looking at that data? Or is it an issue of not sharing? Because there may be issues of trust. Um, one area that has certainly come up, and I'm sure Tuki and Winfred would agree, is around food waste. Food waste and um, food that could be redistributed actually is a very political issue. It can be very sensitive, it can be quite a hidden issue, and it may be that people involved in dealing with food waste don't want to be seen, they don't want to be discussed, the data, they don't want that data out there. So these are some of the challenges. And I suppose there is potentially a trade-off between the data and the information that is easy to get and is easy to act on, um, and seems like an obvious place to start for a city, but, and, but, but then also working on the areas that actually perhaps need the most attention and need the most action. Um, and, and potentially, as we've talked in the rest of the series about uh, the process of creating that strategy and having those conversations um, with your stakeholders in your city to allow you to identify those areas that need action, um, that allows you to really uh, look at the system holistically and take action where it's needed. Yeah, definitely. And I often think with when we start working on these food system strategies and monitoring and looking at data, in a way, it doesn't matter where you start, because the whole point is that it is all connected. It is a system. So it's a bit like taking a lot of weed out of a pond. It's all in a tangle, but start with one and then you'll find the next bit and then you'll find the next bit and then you'll find the next bit. Um, so I think Really, my main com uh, comment is, is don't get daunted by data, take it very simply one step at a time and start with where there's a gap or where there's energy, where, the, where it's a priority and there's a benefit to the stakeholders to take a look. Thank you, Joy. Do any of our other speakers, uh, would they like to come in on the uh, plugging gaps question? Yeah, um, I just want to, you know, uh, highlight uh, some issues, uh, especially with respect to the Indian context. Uh, data is usually available, but then the data is always fragmented. It's with, it's 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 there in bits and pieces with different departments. So stakeholder mapping is a really important exercise to understand. You know who have you know who are the stakeholders in your plan? 
what data do they have and you know how do you sort of you know communicate it to them in a way that they can understand to share that for a larger purpose because these data are collected by some departments for their own use and you know um, so there's a lot of hesitancy in sharing but then if you map your stakeholders you know properly you know try to communicate as to what you're doing with the data so that really helps in building trust with, between the departments and then sharing of data becomes easy for you know uh, planning purpose thank you great thank you I guess to put one last question um, to our speakers. Is there any data that you found particularly useful for influencing policy change within your city? Or perhaps, uh, Nikhil, would you, would you be able to come in on that one? Yeah. Um, uh... We have looked at data, but then it was not for a policy state as such, but mostly focusing on research with an implication for policy. Like we looked at data of the fruits and vegetables which were coming into the city of Vishakapatnam during the pandemic, because India had one of the strictest lockdowns last year between March, end of March and uh, beginning of June. So how did, you know, like the city cope up with in terms of fruits and vegetable intake, but uh, surprisingly the quantity compared to the pre pandemic levels was you know almost similar to what the quantity that was that we that that arrived in, in this farmers market and the price also sort of you know was similar to the pre pandemic levels so in terms of that you know it's um, so uh, uh, you know in terms of uh, the results of the results actually say, say that you know if, if there is a strong um, government support to such initiatives you can really uh, sort of you know improve or you know maintain the uh, quality and the quantity and the price of food that is coming in into the city uh, this is really important because covid will not be the last pandemic that we will see and there will be another future shocks in you know future shocks uh, going forward so these sort of strategies if we can sort of you know highlight and then build into the system i think this will really help great thank you Winfred, could I come to you on that question? If there are any particular areas of data collection that you found that have directly influenced uh, policy through your findings? Thank you. Uh, as maybe as uh, Joy indicated, uh, when uh, you are doing a research and then you are unable to get more data, uh, what we did when we are doing the Milan Urban Food Policy Indicators uh, Monitoring, uh, we encountered that challenge, yes. And uh, what we did was uh, whatever data we got, however little it was, uh, we appreciated it. Once you get that little data you get, then you continue and you build on that. Uh, if there's any policy change, uh, which occurs maybe in a city or wherever, I think uh, this is for a better, a better situation. Maybe you want to rectify something or something is missing. Uh, mostly, uh, if something is missing, then uh, policy changes, they come to improve on something, a gap you have already identified. So uh, that is what I would say. Great, thank you very much. Well, that brings us to the end of today's webinar. A huge thanks to all of our speakers um, today for your contributions. And thank you very much to all of you for joining us. Um, and we have our next webinar in uh, two weeks time as usual. And we're going to be looking at how to start implementing a strategy and turning it into action, beginning uh, with looking at working with partners um, across the city. So we hope you can join us for that. And as usual, I'll be sending a link in the follow-up along with the recording and the presentations from all of our speakers. So thank you again for joining us. Enjoy the rest of your day. And we look forward to seeing you again in a couple of weeks time. Thank you very much, everyone. Goodbye. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thanks. Good luck, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.